I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. We will be talking about the time of Jesus' trouble. You've heard of the time of Jacob's trouble, right? Yes. And you probably read in the Great Controversy, the time of trouble, chapter 39. We know it's going to be difficult, but we also know who's going to be with us, right? Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ will be with us. You might remember, um, maybe, maybe you might not, because the first day we were together, um, I guess yesterday, I was, I was able to share a quote from the book Education. I want to share that again. And we're going to see in the time of Jesus' trouble, ministration of angels. And I hope that you will be blessed in that time that we're together. So let me, uh, let me find that education quote where it talks about army of youth. And we'll be able to look at that after we pray. So, if you would like to bow your heads, please do so. And then we will get into the message of Jesus' time of trouble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that you've given us the opportunity to be again together. And I pray that you please help us to understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches. We thank you for the message of the gospel that you've given to us. We thank you that you have revealed so many amazing things to your son, and it was the spirit of Christ, your son, being in the, uh, the prophets. And we know that uh, the stories that we look at, they're going to be revealing things to us that perhaps we haven't seen before. I ask that you'd please help us to know what it is that we should understand, and I thank you so much for everything you've given. Please continue to lead us. Do not trust me with any words before your people, we pray, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the book Education, you've heard about this army of youth, right? What I'm excited about is I've seen a lot of young people in these meetings, and I'm so grateful to not only see the young people, but when I'm talking to you young people as well, you're able to explain the Bible truths very well. That's inspiring to me. I know some of the young people back at home in America, they're not as interested as what I have seen the young people are here. And so I want to say praise God for what is going on right here in Kenya. Amen? Amen. With such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. Now, we've read that quote many times, but the other night I was able to share the previous paragraph. Watch this one. The previous paragraph says, There is no line of work in which it is possible for the youth to receive greater benefit. All who engage in ministry are God's helping hand. They are co-workers with the angels, it says. Now, it also says, rather, they are the human agencies through whom the angels accomplish their mission. So, did you hear what that said? They are co-working with the angels, and they are also the human agencies through whom the angels accomplish their mission. It says, angels speak through their voices and work by their hands. And the human workers, cooperating with heavenly agencies, which are the angels, have the benefit of their education and experience, and as a mean of education. What university course can equal this? So now, working with the angels in ministry, you get a better education than university. Amen? Amen. Now that doesn't mean you should stop going to school, unless the Lord calls you, because He might do that. But what I'm saying is, if you start ministry, even maybe while you're at school, you tell those people around you what you believe, and you will be working, co-working with the angels. That's awesome. And you will receive a better education than anybody else there if they're not sharing the gospel. So with such an army of workers as our youth, 
rightly trained might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. In the context of working with angels. Wow. So now we're going to talk about Jesus' time of trouble. The time of Jesus' trouble. What does this mean? Well, Jesus was in the wilderness, and you'll be surprised to think it through. When he was in the wilderness, we're going to read it for a moment, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. What do you mean, if? Doubt. Yeah. The enemy was putting doubt into the mind of Christ, or trying to anyways. And so, if you're the Son of God. If... 40 days ago, you really heard the voice of your Father in heaven that said, this is my beloved Son. If you really went through that, and you're not just hallucinating because you haven't had any food for 40 days, if really you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now what's happening here? I'll tell you what's happening here. The devil is tempting Christ with self. You ever thought about that? The devil is tempting Christ with self. If you're really the son of God, then use your divine powers and take care of your personal needs. Go ahead. I mean, if you really are the Son of God, (laughs) the Creator, go ahead. (coughs) Take care of your physical self. And so, if Christ would have done that, He would have used His powers to go contrary to what God had laid out for Him to do. And it would have been inconsistent with His Father's will. Right? And so, what's happening here is Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Christ didn't try to defend himself with his own words. He quoted the words directly from Deuteronomy. And then, of course, the devil taketh him up into the holy city. Now, what's fascinating about that is this word taken actually means carried. He received, he took. You can see in in your translations or, uh, how would you say, your margin. He actually took him. He carried him. Why? Because he hadn't eaten for 40 days. You'd probably want to be taken up a mountain too, right? Or to the holy city to the and setting him up on the pinnacle of the temple. So the pinnacle was a high point of the temple. And so if you hadn't eaten in 40 days... And you are supposed to get onto the top of the temple. You're probably going to need some help. (laughs) You don't have a lot of strength after 40 days if you haven't eaten. And so he took him into the holy city, setting up up on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If you are the Son of God, if, cast yourself down. And then the enemy says, For it is written. (laughs) God the Father will give his angels, he points to himself, charge concerning you. And in their hands, just like I carried you, in their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now remember, Jesus, you didn't dash your foot against a stone because I carried you up here. And remember, when I carried you, I carried you in my hands. And just like the Bible says, in the hands of the angels, they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And so what is, what is the enemy doing here? The enemy is tapping into the knowledge that Christ has about angels. 
Because Christ knew Psalm 91, didn't he? And so the enemy is saying, oh, like, okay, listen. When you're in trouble, you're supposed to call on God, you know, the God, the creator God, and he's supposed to send his angels to help you, to carry you. In their hands they will carry you. That's what I'm doing. So if you haven't read the book Confrontation, you ought to pick up that book and read it. How many have read that book, Confrontation? Good, we got one, two, three ish three people it's not a very popular book but it's really powerful there are 13 if i believe, if i remember correctly there are 13 articles that were written by ellen white about this time in christ's history his experience in the wilderness and she wrote those 13 articles and then those 13 articles were put together in a book called confrontation and so if you wanted to read that you'd find some really good information about the time that christ was there with the enemy in the garden, or I'm sorry, in the uh, wilderness. What we know is that Jesus answered this temptation of if again. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Jesus knew what faith is. Faith is taking God at his word, not testing him by his word, right? And so if Christ would have thrown himself down, God very likely would not have sent an angel to catch him before he hit the ground. And so whether this temptation came to Christ or not, he wasn't going to do it. Because he knew that he wasn't going to be presumptuous in regard to his father. And so he didn't want to tempt God by throwing himself down just to see if God would be able to catch him. I know God could catch him, right? But if you throw yourself down to the ground... You might be surprised God won't catch you. You're going to get hurt, <laughs> right? There is a law of what God has created called gravity. The law of gravity. And if you choose to break the law of gravity, you're going to get hurt. And so Christ knew that. Christ didn't want to break the law of gravity just to test God to prove that the enemy didn't have anything to talk about. So, chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him, carried him. The devil takes him into an exceeding high mountain. Now, you ought to try fasting for 40 days and go climb an exceeding high mountain. It's very difficult, right? So he climbs up this exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. <laughs> and he said this, all these things will I give unto you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, don't miss what just happened. Do you know that there is a place in southern, the southern slopes of Mount Hermon? This is probably one of the, uh, this is, in fact, the highest area in that land. It's 2,236 meters. That means it is 7,000 336 feet. So the mountain's about 7,000 feet high. And when the devil took him up into a high mountain, it was very likely one of these mountains. It is the highest elevation in Israeli controlled territory. And so what did he do? The enemy took Christ up into a high mountain, and it says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All right. So I've been on very high mountains. In fact, um, it wasn't long ago I flew to Australia to be able to present the truth about God. And we were at 40,000 feet in the air. That's pretty high. There's no mountains that are 40,000 feet. Okay, we were way up there. I could not see all the kingdoms of the world. You know what I could see? I could see the curvature of the earth just a little bit. I thought that was interesting. I had never seen that before, but I got a picture of it. But I couldn't see all the kingdoms of the world from even 44 or 40,000 feet. And so what did the devil do? Say it again. He gave a vision. So what happened is the enemy was able to expose that he had what you could consider the spirit of prophecy. Isn't that interesting? What do I mean the spirit of prophecy? Let's go there. Watch this. 
Um, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 19, and I think it's verse 8. No, 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 no. Where are we? 10, I think it's 10. Yeah, there it is. So the angel had just showed John all of these amazing things in the, in the explanation of this vision of heaven that he had just seen, remember? There was, of course, chapter 17, chapter 18 with the destruction of Babylon and then the praise about what God had done to Babylon in chapter 19. The marriage of the supper and all those things that are going on, the marriage supper of the lamb, rather. And then it says in verse 10 of chapter 19, and I, John, fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, no, 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 don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so according to this verse that we just read, who has the testimony of Jesus? The angel does. The angel has the testimony of Jesus. He says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus, that thing which I have, the angel says, is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, did I just read that an angel has the spirit of prophecy? That's what it says, doesn't it? He says, I am of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. So he's saying, I have the testimony of Jesus. And then he says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That says that angels have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Isn't that amazing? Have you seen that before? You haven't seen that before, have you? But it's right there. That's what it says. Now watch this. As we go to chapter 22, and I think it's verse 10. Someone is requesting that you repeat. Repeat that? Okay. So let's see right here. What it's saying is Jesus uh, had sent his angel to reveal to John the things that had just happened in chapter 19. Now what happens is the, uh, John fell at the feet to worship the angel. The angel said, no, 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 don't worship me. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. So I am a fellow servant and a brother that has the testimony of Jesus. So, according to this verse, the angel has the testimony of Jesus. And the, it continues on saying, worship God, don't worship me. Now, listen, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What this is saying, just read it right here. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that has, that has the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, you see that? So what's happening is the angels have the spirit of prophecy. The angels have the testimony of Jesus. And the devil knows that. So what did the devil do in the wilderness? He gave a vision to Christ. Why? So that Christ would see an exposition of the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. The revelation that angels have given to the prophets. What do I mean by that? Well, who's the one that told Daniel about the 2300 days and the explanation about it? That was Gabriel. Is Gabriel God? Is Gabriel God the Spirit? Is Gabriel an angel? Yes. Did the angel reveal to, jo to Daniel future events and prophecy? Could it be is because that the angels have the testimony of Jesus, yes. the spirit of prophecy? Yes. yes. Amazing. So we many times have been told that the spirit of prophecy is the writings of Ellen White. And sure, that's true. I believe she had the spirit of prophecy, but that doesn't mean she is the spirit of prophecy. You see what I'm saying? Her books were written by inspiration. Do you know how many times, I don't know how many times, but let me just say this. How many times did she say, I was with my, quote, attending angel? You remember that, right? Why was she with an attending angel? Because the angel was revealing the things to her that she needed to be able to understand so that she can write and you can read it. What were you saying? Yeah, because the angel had the spirit of prophecy that, she was, that, that Ellen White was receiving from the angel. Now, so go to Revelation 22, verse 10, and let's see, maybe it's 8 and 9. Yeah, there it is, 8 and 9. 22, verse 8. I, John, saw these things and heard them. 
When I heard and I had seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now remember, he's already done this a couple of chapters before. And then the angel said unto me, don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the what? Prophets. And of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Okay, so wait a minute. Does this say that the angels are prophets? What does it say? Yes. I am your fellow servant, and I'm one of your brothers, the prophets. That's what it's saying, isn't it? Wow. You never knew that until today, did you? Well, see, this is why the enemy came to Christ and gave him that vision of being there and seeing all the kingdoms of the world. You see, because what happened is, um, when he took him up into that high mountain and he showed him all the things, he was able to do that by what we know as a false spirit of prophecy. There are such things as visions and dreams that are not God's, right? Not God's visions or dreams. They don't belong to God is what I mean. So that is a false expression or exposition of the spirit of prophecy. And this is what the devil gave to Jesus. Because Jesus knew that Enoch was taught by the angels. Moses was taught by the angels. Joshua was taught by the angels. We have, who else? The prophets were taught by the angels. Because the angels have the spirit of prophecy. Fascinating. And so, he said, all these things will I give unto you if you fall down and worship me. Well, Jesus, he, he didn't like that one. He said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So who was Jesus saying that you should worship and serve? His Father, God. Amen. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't worship Jesus as well, because God has commanded that we should worship Jesus. They even commanded the angels to do that in, in Hebrews chapter 1. Now, so notice what it says in verse 11. Watch, okay, now let me ask you this question. If Jesus had just gone through the most difficult trial that he had ever faced since being a human, he had not yet entered into such a battle against physical and spiritual um, temptations as when he was here in the wilderness. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and he met the devil face to face. He was faced with temptation about um, distrusting his father's words, if you are the son of God, because you just heard your father, and did you really hear that? And also, he was tempted to take care of self. He was basically starving, and he was faced with the idea of false prophecy, or spirit of prophecy, and he was also tempted to worship Satan so that he wouldn't have to face the cross. You see, because the enemy, he was saying, just worship me and I'll give you everything. It's all mine. You don't have to die on the cross in order to get everything. You just worship me and I'll give it to you. That's, that was what was happening there, right? And so what was going on is Jesus had just gone through the most intense suffering of his life in temptation. And who did God send to strengthen and comfort him? Notice verse 11. The devil leave, leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. <laughs> really? You mean it wasn't God the Holy Spirit? I mean, you would think, as a Trinitarian, if you were just suffering that much, you wouldn't want just an angel. You would want God the Holy Spirit, right? Well, that's not God's plan. God sent angels to minister to his son. Now, remember, we had read that quote in the youth's instructor with the word emblematical. And it talked about the, the angels were solicitous to bear to the praying redeemer messages of assurance and love. You remember that? But God said, no, 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 no. I'm going to do it. And see, he sent uh, light and glory from the throne and there was the form of a dove that came down which was emblematical of the meekness and gentleness of Christ you remember that 
Well, that was only 40 days earlier. And so now the angels have the opportunity to go down and bear messages of assurance and love to the Savior. Can you imagine how excited the angels were to be here with Christ at this time? I bet they were excited. And so what we see is that God was able to minister to his son through angels. Watch this. This is when the divinity of Christ came to the aid of his humanity. With divine authority, he commanded, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I have a question for you. Is this something that Christ had that we do not have access to? Yes or no? What's the answer? The answer is no. Christ didn't have anything on this earth that was more than what we can have access to. And so you're telling me that there are times when the divinity of Christ will come to the aid of my humanity? Amen. And you too. Every one of you. If you surrender your life to Christ and you do missionary service for him, you will have the aid of Christ's divinity. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, we're going to need it. We're going to need that help, that aid, because we cannot do anything without Christ. Remember, I was saying earlier, John 15, I believe it's verse 5. It says, apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. But with me, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, right? Do you think that is divine nature coming to your aid? Absolutely. So the divinity of Christ came to the aid of his humanity. Wow. I thought he was divine. He was. Jesus was assaulted. Now remember, in John, uh, Luke 4, 16. Um, Luke 4, 16. Jesus, remember, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as it was custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. There was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And so he opens it up to chapter 61. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He found the place. He was looking for it. He opened it up to what we know as chapter 61. They didn't have chapters at that time. Verse uh, 18. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has appointed or anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay, so what was he doing right now? Was he preaching? He had been given the scripture to open it up to read and share to the congregation. And he went directly to the area where it says, I have been anointed to preach to who? The poor. What was he calling the people that were sitting in the synagogue? The poor. <laughs> they didn't like that very much. They said, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you? What, what's going on here? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. In other words, you that are listening to me have a broken heart. That's a broken character, by the way. And it says, to preach deliverance to the captives. Okay, so what? You saying that we're captive? Captive to what? Captive to whom? To recovery of sight to the blind. Oh, now you're saying that we're blind men, right? So you see how these people are receiving it? You can read that in the Desire of Ages. They were receiving it just this way. To set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now remember, he didn't finish that verse that we know of as, I think it's verse 2. He read a portion of it, but he didn't finish it. Why? Because that last part in the Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, that was the part that they loved. They loved to be able to hear that justice that would come, that final deliverance that they would be given from the Romans. And they really focused on that part, but they didn't like the idea of being blind and captive and poor, right? And so, but they liked that last part. He didn't finish that verse. He stopped right there. They were waiting for that part because that was the amen part. But he, he stopped. 
He closed the book. He gave it again to the minister, and then he sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Did I say something funny? That was the amen part. That was the part where everybody was supposed to say amen. Sorry, I thought maybe I said something wrong. Okay, I got you. He closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in a synagogue were fastened on him. They were looking at him like, did he just read that? He just read that. He found that place and read it in our church. And he didn't even finish the verse. And then it says, Jesus began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Oh, that gives me the chills just saying it. Those people were called poor and blind and naked. They were called captives. They, they were told they needed deliverance. And they didn't like it. And so what happened? All bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't the son of God. Is this Joseph's son? We know Joseph. I mean, he's right down the road in the carpenter shop. We know who this guy is, but who's this man? Claiming to be the Messiah, the one that's anointed, the Mashiach. Yeah, right. And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in this country. Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth. And then he goes on and explains that there were some that were not even Israelites that accepted the message. And they were blessed. And you guys won't even accept the message. And they heard that they were so upset with Christ having been there in their synagogue and teaching these things that they... In this, um, and all they that were in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon their, the city was built, that they might cast him headlong. They were about to throw him off the cliff. They were going to kill him after his first sermon. He, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Okay, so Jesus is in another serious time of trouble. He's about to be thrown off of a cliff because he just preached present truth. He said, this scripture is fulfilled today in your ears. And they didn't like it. They were going to throw him off a cliff, and what happened? He just passed through the midst of them. How did he do that? Yes, sir, angels. Notice what it says on page 240 in Desire of Ages. Angels shut him in from his enemies. Angels. Amen. Amen. I love it. You didn't know that angels were prophets, did you? You didn't know that the angels had the spirit of prophecy in the testimony of Jesus. You knew that angels shouldn't be worshipped. But you didn't know that angels were the ones that were sent to comfort Christ after the 40 days in the wilderness. And also that angels were the one that protected him from being killed after his first sermon. Amazing. What about Jesus in the garden? So, you know this one, right? Luke 22, verses 40 through 44. It says, When he was at the place, which was the Garden of Gethsemane, he said unto the three disciples, James, uh, Peter, James, and John, Pray that you enter not into, temptation, into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Never less than this, though, not my will, but thine be done. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, Lord, I don't want to go through this. I personally do not want what is coming. I don't like this. If it were up to me, I wish it would be over. My will says don't go forward. Christ was struggling against his own desires. Self. This was a struggle against self. But, he said, nevertheless, 
not my desires, not my will, not what my mind is telling me, but let your mind guide me. Amen. Amen. We're going to have to know that struggle. And so what happens after he went through that, remember three times he prayed. It says that, I think, in Matthew. And it goes on and says in verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, it says that he was sweating great drops of blood. You know, if an angel wasn't sent to him at this time in the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have died before he got on the cross. An angel came to give him extra strength to live. Oh, wow. Are you telling me an angel did that? Oh, yes. Angels. And do you know that the early, uh, the, the book Education says that we can enter into, what does it say now? The, we can benefit by their education and experience? Wow. You mean that the angel that ministered to Christ, if I'm in trouble, he might be able to come and minister to me and I can learn from his education and experience? It just might happen that way. <laughs> Amazing. And if you're given a vision, by the way, or a dream, it's very likely your angel is the one that gave it to you. Wow. Angels? <laughs> yeah, angels. Oh, we're t I'm telling you, there's tons more. We're just touching it right now. So now, in the third spirit of prophecy, the dense blackness was an emblem of the soul agony and horror that encompassed the Son of God. He had felt it in the Garden of Gethsemane, when from his pores were forced drops of blood, and where he would have died had not, what? An angel been sent from the courts of heaven to invigorate the divine sufferer, that he might tread his blood-stained path to Calvary. <laughs> okay, Sister White just said the angel strengthened him to live. He would have died in the garden. That's amazing. Absolutely. To me, it's absolutely incredible. You know, as a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I didn't think twice about the angels. I was thankful. Like, they sang when Jesus came. They were there singing during the time the creation was going on. They protect us from potentially getting in an accident. But, you know, angels but now it's like wow angels it's amazing they're just incredible god uses them to do almost every single thing that the spirit of christ does now that does not mean that the angels are the spirit of christ no no christ is the lord of sabaoth which is the lord of hosts he commands the angels, and Mrs. White calls them the agencies of heaven. God works through his agencies, and what does he do? He does all kinds of stuff through his angels. It's incredible. So what about Sodom and Gomorrah? You remember that, right? They were delivered by angels. How many angels? Three. The angel of the Lord, and then the two that went down. Because the angel of the Lord basically was telling... Um, Abraham that well we won't get into it there's a whole message that I have um, I guess I need to present it again because I don't think it's online but it's called the Advent movement in Sodom and Gomorrah if you go through every single point of that story in Genesis 18 and 19 every single point you can see in chronological order the Adventist history starting from the first angel to the second angel to the third angel, including the closed door and the second closed door, including the blindness or Babylon being fallen, including the uh, women that were wanting to commit fornication, including all those things. It's all there. Look for it. It's incredible. Okay, now, so if they were delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah, 
by angels, what did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Lot. What do you mean as it was in the days of Lot? So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, right? Well, if it is in the days of the coming of the Son of Man as it was in the days of Lot, who will deliver us? Angels. angels. He shall give his angels angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest thou dash thy foot against the stone <laughs> yes sir okay what about second kings the king of syria said go and spy where elisha is that i may send and fetch him and it was told him saying behold he is in dothan therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host who are the horses and chariots and a great host from the king called the king of, of Syria. What, what is that? When he sends horses and chariots and a great host? His army. So the king of Syria, right here, he said, go spy where Elisha is, that I might send and fetch him. And it was told the king, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent the king horses and chariots and a great host. Okay? So those horses and chariots and a great host are armies. Is that fair? So he sent his armies to go get the faithful remnant. Elisha. Because everybody else was in apostasy. They were worshiping idols. But there was one that worshiped the one true God. They came by night, so it was dark, and they compassed the city of Dothan where Elisha was. Okay, so now it's nighttime. You know who the children of the night are, correct? It's the king of Syria with all his armies. The children of the night show up and they surround the city where the faithful remnant is. And so what happens is when the servant of the man of God was risen up early, you can imagine he was probably brushing his teeth or something. <laughs> the servant of God was risen up early and he had gone forth and behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and his servant said unto him which was Elisha alas my master how shall we do and he answered fear not for they that be with us are more than they that be with them Amen. who is he speaking about angels. angels right and Elisha prayed and said Lord I pray thee open his eyes that he may see and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Okay, wait a minute. The king of Syria had horses and chariots and a great host. What did we call that? An army. An army. And now Elisha, with his servant, is able to see horses and chariots of fire. What would we call that? An army. Okay, so now, the army of the king of Syria probably had swords and shields and the, what do they call that, habergon? What is that? The breastplate, but also the habergon, which is like the, uh, the chain mail. That's it, chain mail, yes. And so they probably had all these things on. Well, guess what? The army of heaven showed up looking just the same. Now, you know what I'm talking about because, or similar, let me say similar. Because there's a quote, and I think I've got it right here. Oh, by the way, yeah, I'll read this one. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So when it talks about these chariots, the horses and chariots of fire, we're actually talking about angels, according to Psalm 68, verse 17. But notice what it says in this section of the great controversy. Um, yes. Some are assailed, it says in Great Controversy 631, some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as a straw. You remember this, right, from the Great Controversy? Others are defended by angels, how? In the form of men of war. Are you telling me that at the end of time we're going to be seeing angels in SWAT team suits? They're going to have those black hats on. They're going to have bulletproof vests on. 
They're going to have hand grenades hanging from their side. They're going to have a machine gun on their back. And they're going to have pistols. I think so. Why not? Because it says up here, it says right here that Elisha prayed and they showed up with horses and chariots. They were chariots of fire, but they were still horses and chariots. That's exactly how we heard that the king of Syria had his armies led out. Horses and chariots. And so at the end of time, when men are dressed or angels are dressed as men of war, we should expect them to look very similar to the people that are in war today. I think it's fascinating. So, let's go ahead and look at Psalm 91. I'll go through this really quickly because we've been together for a minute already. Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, which is the Father, he is the Most High, he shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Again, another reference to the Father, the Almighty. That is not the Son. I will say of the Lord... He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. So trusting in the most high God, in the almighty, being under his shadow, where he is above you protecting, that's where we need to be at the end of time. Amen? Trusting in our refuge and fortress. Surely, it says, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. The fowler, that would be somebody who catches something, right? Somebody who can trick you into being trapped. And so the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Noisome is something that's very agitating or annoying. And a pestilence would be like a disease or like bugs, some things like that. You know, I have to share with you last night, I, I woke up at, at one o'clock in the morning because that's in the middle of the day for me. So it's kind of weird to sleep in the middle of the day. And so I lost a lot of sleep. I didn't go back to sleep after one. That's why I was sleeping earlier during the, the previous message. But when I woke up at one o'clock, I got, I got up and I went to use the restroom and I came back and I was looking, I went to sit down and get some of that uh, chamomile tea because I heard that's good to keep you from like any kind of uh, sicknesses Insomnia. and stuff. From what? Insomnia. Insomnia, yeah, it, it helped me go back to sleep too, right? So I wanted to take some of that and I'm sitting there drinking it and out of the corner of my eye, I see something move on the table. <laughs> I looked over there and I said, no, there's nothing that should move. So I turned on my flashlight and I looked it was a big cockroach. I was like, oh man, why is it gonna be like that? I don't like those things, man. So I showed my light on him and he took off and went down the I showed my light on him again, he took off and went, get out of here. You know? I was gonna see the bugs are coming around like that bee earlier. I don't like those things. And so for me, the noise and pestilence, that would be that, I don't like that. I don't like pestilence, right? <laughs> Don't worry, we have them in America too. But that one last night, that was like the grandfather. I mean, that was like, he, was, he was big. I, I showed my light right on him so he'd get out of there, man. <laughs> yeah, we don't have them like that in America. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay. So now, the noisome pestilence, those are the things that we will be kept from if we trust in our Father. Amen? And so I really like that idea. I really appreciate this section of the Bible. But notice what it says here in verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers. So he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth, that's the Father's truth, shall be thy shield and buckler. What do you mean shield and buckler? You know a shield is a very large piece of equipment. If you were wanting to be defensive in war, you would grab a shield, you would hide behind it, and you could just be there, and it would take all the heat for you. You know those arrows that have fire on them? The fiery darts that we read about in Ephesians chapter 6? They would shoot those fiery darts, and they would come flaming through the sky, and when they would hit something, they would light it on fire. If you have a shield that has been doused in water, soaked in water, it's very heavy. And when those um, fiery darts hit it, they are, they are extinguished. Okay? That's the idea of having the shield. Well, the buckler is not the same thing as a shield, though it is a shield. A buckler is very small 
in comparison to the shield. The shield is big, the buckler is small. Now remember, the, the shield is for the defensive. You just want to be protected. The buckler is for the offensive. If you have a buckler in your hand, it's, just, it's, it's about this big, and you're able to wield it quickly. Now, if you have a sword in your right hand, the sword of the spirit, and you have a buckler, you, if somebody comes to attack you, you're able to see above the buckler, and when they throw their sword or a spear at you, you're going to be able to move and still have a hand where you could use the sword. If you have a shield, you're not going to be able to reach around and try to get somebody around your shield, you see? So it doesn't make good sense to be using a shield in an offensive attack. You use a shield in the defensive, but a buckler is for the offensive. So both during the times that you will be active in war against the enemy using the sword of the spirit, or at a time where you just need to take a break and relax and pray. Either one, you will have a shield or a buckler when you trust in God the Father. You will not be afraid for the terror by night. Terror? What is terror? Terror is dread, fear, or great terror, okay? Terror is something in the mind, is it not? Now, you've been afraid before, right? Have you ever been terrified? Like, honestly, literally terrified? I may have been, but I can't recall. I'd have to go and think it through a little bit, but I've been afraid many times, but never terrified. We're talking about terror. So this is a mental thing. Okay, when you're using the shield and the buckler, it's going to be a mental thing as well. You will not be afraid of the mental attacks, the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. Now, an arrow, that's like a single shot. You know what I mean? It's like a pistol. But an arrow is just one shot at a time. You don't shoot like a bunch of arrows in, you know, unless you've got a whole lineup. But... You won't be afraid of the arrow, singular, not arrows, arrow that flies by day. We're talking about single shots. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness. Again, those crazy, like, you know what I'm talking about. For the pestilence that walks in darkness. Nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now, the destruction that wastes at noonday, we're not talking about single shots here. We're talking about bombs. Okay. So you won't be afraid of the single shots, neither will you be afraid of the bombs. Why? Because you trust in God, and you are under His wings, you were under His shadow, you were in His most holy place. Of course, that's in the sanctuary, you understand. Verse 7, One thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to be, but it's going to be pretty crazy. You're going to be tempted with terror. You're going to be tempted with single shots, with pestilence, with darkness, with bombs, with all these things going on. And there will be a thousand falling and ten thousand falling, but somehow you're not going to be affected. Can you imagine a bomb going off right next to you? And you see this complete destruction on the left and on the right, but you're okay. What's going on? You're going to know that you're fulfilling this prophecy right here of Psalm 91. Only with your eyes will you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Not with your ears. It says only with your eyes. Now, does that mean excluding your ears? You won't hear what's going on. You're just going to see it. Imagine being in some kind of 3D atmosphere where stuff is just going boom, boom, and you're looking around and you're seeing it, but you're not, heal you're not hearing it, you're not feeling it. You're just wondering, what is happening? Thank the Lord I've been under the shadow of the Almighty. When that goes on, only with your eyes will you behold the, re the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, you've actually lived there, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Now, what plagues are we talking about at this time? We're talking about the seven last plagues, right? No plague is going to come near your dwelling. And where does your family live? In your dwelling. So there's a chance you might be saved from the, the, the uh, plagues that are coming upon the world. For he, the reason why you won't, 
have these things going on with you is because he will give his angels, his what? Angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Wait a minute, I thought the Holy Spirit was supposed to keep me in all my ways. Yeah? Remember Hebrews chapter 1, verses 7 and 14. I will read them. Hebrew, oh, Hebrews 1, sorry. Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. It says, The angels, he to the angels, he saith, who makes his angels, what's the next word? Spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? Yes. They are ministering spirits. They either minister the spirit of God or the evil angels minister the spirit of Satan. Okay? And so what we see here is that angels are spirits. And so they will be able to keep you from falling. Where is that? Let's see. Where did, I, where did I see that? Yeah, there it is. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways because they're ministering spirits. They shall bear thee up in their hands. They will carry you lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So you are going to be carried by angels just like the enemy carried Christ in the wilderness of temptation. You will tread upon the lion and the adder. Who is the lion going about seeking whom he may devour? That's Satan, right? You are going to tread upon Satan. Now, what does it say in, I think it's Romans 16, verse 20? Romans 16, I think it's 20 or 21. Um, yeah, there it is. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Does that say that we're going to be able to bruise Satan under our feet? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's what it says in Psalm 91, verse 13. You will tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under your feet. You're going to be victorious over the enemy during this time. Why? Because he will give his angels charge concerning thee, that in their hands they will bear you up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, the time of trouble. Just like he was with Jesus in his times of trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is amazing promises for us to understand in regard to the angelic ministry that is active right now. There's much more to talk about in regard to the angels. But this is just a little time to look at what God did through his angelic ministers to be able to take care of Christ when he was threatened with death, when he was threatened with, with temptations beyond what any other human could endure, he was tempted with dying in the wilderness because of the trials he was going through. Remember, he even said to the disciples, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto what? Death. He told the disciples, I'm about to die because I'm being crushed. And angels came to minister to Christ. And so we can know and understand that when we're in trouble, we can pray that God will send his ministers to us as well, the ministering spirits. And so I want to continue learning more about the angels. What about you? And as young people, I encourage you to learn about the angels so that you can benefit from their experience and their education. And they can use you to do their mission through your hands and through your mouths. You want to work with the angels? Yes. Me too. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, that you've given us the opportunity to be able to understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches today. You've helped us learn a little bit more about your spiritual ministry. You use your angels. Lord, we are grateful for all that you've done. We've, we're grateful for the care that you have given us. 
We thank you that angels can be right near us. We know they are because in the judgment, they will be used as the mouth of one or two or three witnesses. We're thankful that you have blessed us also with the ministration of your son's omnipresent spirit. We pray that we would be able to, just like Abram in Genesis 18, experience being able to spend time with your son through his spirit and also through the angels. We ask that they would draw near and keep us, comfort us, help them at times to be able to bear us up in their hands that we do not dash our foot against a stone. Help us to understand that those cartoons that we've heard so many times in the past, where a good angel is on the left and a bad angel is on the right, those things are real. Help us to understand that we are directed and ministered to by your angels. Help us not to, re to neglect study in regard to what you've done and what you are doing through them. We realize that you are using them as agencies of heaven. And we pray that they would draw near and that we would be kept and ministered to by them as we're entering into very soon the time of Jacob's trouble. We've seen the time of your son's trouble and how he was ministered to by angels. We pray that you'd please help us to continue to learn and understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches. We thank you in regard to this, praying that you would continue to lead our minds, that we can glorify you in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.